Okay, so uh, first of all, I'm very happy uh, uh, to be here this afternoon and speaking after so many prestigious uh, speakers. So my talk is going to be about random matrices with some applications about 5G and the titles from Shannon to Wiener, of course. So basically, before introducing the topic that I'm going to talk about, it, about uh, you have to know that, uh, as I told in the beginning, Huawei has been opening a research center and we have uh, a huge effort in our teams working on 5G technologies. Uh, related to something that's going to be happening in 2020. So for people who are not familiar with that, you have to know the generations of telecommunications are around 20 years. Things have started with 2G, as you know, which is what we call uh, voice with mobility, which started in 1990s and ended in the, or it's, it's, it's still not, end. It, it's still going on, but you can see a lot of GSM, I would say, uh, 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 networks going down around 2010, roughly 20 years. Then, basically, after voice, people thought about bringing video, and that's when 3G came in, and what we call visiophony. And that started around 2000, with basically 2020, it still continues. Of course, we came up with the fact that visiophony was not working that well, and then there was a change in bringing what we call mobile internet around that thing. Same thing, around 2010, people started working, uh, de deploying 4G technologies, with the rough estimate of 20 years, meaning until 2030, and that's the rough time where we're at the moment, we're deploying those technologies. You have to know it's roughly 20 years, five to 10 years before people start doing research. Same thing for 5G, it will be starting in 2020, going on until 2040. We started the research already in 2012, 2013, and it's going on, with the aim of developing, I would say, the standard between 2016 and 2018. So now a lot of research teams around the world are preparing the technologies, such as at the standard point of view, which is in 2016. We have things that go in the standard for 2018, and then with all the different prototypes, developments, 2020 we have the technologies, okay? So what was 4G, by the way? Mostly mobile internet, totally providing high-speed mobile internet to the user, and basically an internet full IP, flat IP uh, framework. You have to know that one of the uh, caveats or drawbacks of 4G is because we wanted to have so much mobile internet, we forgot about voice, and voice was considered within 4G as nothing, not a technology anymore, but an application. And you have things like voice over LTE going on over there, with all the fact that it's not working that well, and people are trying to solve it at the moment right now, okay? Now, what is 5G about? The same thing, when you define a technology, you define what you want, and then be behind it, there's the technology which is gonna be doing it. So you have to define what's the aim of 5G. The same thing you have to know in 4G, the technology behind is what we call LT Advanced, or WiMAX Mobile, 802.16M. The same thing in 3G, we have CDMA as a technology, but different flavors. The same thing as 2G, we have IS95. We have also other technologies like GSM, which is the most known in the world. Around 5G, we're still not at the technological phase. We're at what we want. And it turns out that uh, uh, there's a common consensus around different organization that basically these are the things that we want around the new technology we're going to deploy. We want systems which have a huge capacity, meaning providing more bits per second per hertz per kilometer square around the Earth, and basically people are trying to find a way to do it. We want also that each user on a given uh, place in, on Earth get also a 10 gigabit, I would say, uh, uh, speed of, uh, of downloads. We want also that the latency tends to be reduced to a factor of one millisecond. Why? Because we have many vertical industries which are looking forward to have a time response which is very low. You take typically uh, what we call the Google car or whatever, your electrical car business and industries which are looking at cars which can be uh, automatically piloted uh, far away. We have also what everything what is called the Internet of Things. Basically, in 5G, we're looking at one possible waveform, one possible way to absorb all these links. And basically, we're looking at one technology which can absorb the massive amount of objects that are going to be communicating. You have to know that these objects, in general, are sending Twitter-like communication. So it's not about high data rate, but it's about low data rate. Massive low data rate, high data rate. And the last point is what we call the energy efficiency. So basically, we need to find one technology which, or a couple of technologies, so this is a big discussion at the moment, which can subsume all these factors at the same time, okay? We know that there's gonna be a lot of devices, around 50 billion 
devices by 2020. We need to absorb them. We know that a lot of people are looking forward for higher data rates for many new applications which are related to e-learning, to uh, holographic uh, purposes. We have also a lot of vertical industries such as the mobile industries and other types which are looking at, at the fact that they can be controlled by a network and all these have to be developed. So at the moment, of course, I'm not going to give you the solution because there's a lot of discussions on many ways to do it. Uh, I'm going to give you a, a generic path, a general way on where research or mathematical tools can be used to analyze one key technology, which is called the MIMO technology. Okay? So, MIMO, multiple input, multiple output. So I'm trying to explain it also to everybody here. So I know that the guys in the lab know things, but it's also for the people in ESUS who have no clue about it. So the same thing as before. Uh, before going and predicting where things can be done, let me go to the past and give you a bit of a flavor about, I would say, wireless technologies and how they, how they have evolved and uh, how we can capture new things out of the past. So you have to know that the mathematical framework of communication started roughly in 1948. 1948, basically, that was a, a very important year uh, for people working in telecommunication. There were two important contributions. One, uh, a contribution here by Shannon called The Mathematical Theory of Communication, published in the Bell System Technical Journal. And basically, the idea of Shannon was to say the following. If I had a model of my environment, at that time, that model was called the AWGN model, Additive White Gaussian Noise Model, then I could know the, the amount of information I could transmit from here to here without error. At the same time, Wiener, I don't know why the, this was a French uh, uh, publisher, but he published it in a French uh, uh, publisher, called Cybernetics or Control and Communication, the Animal of the Machine, had the idea of saying the following, well, in general, it's very hard to have a model of my environment. Why? Because things are varying, there's a lot of changes. So basically what I'll do is, through a process called feedback, I will try to shape my output, my inputs, such I can target my output. In that case, of course, you don't have a notion of zero error, you have a notion of outage. Okay, at that time, that outage was called the MMSE, minimum mean square error. And basically, through an analog feedback to a process, you could develop exactly the target that you wanted to this process. Okay? So what happened now, 60 years later, which is around the years 2000 and after, well, instead of having in our system, and this is exactly what we have in 5G to the fact that we have a multiplicity of inputs, we have a framework where we have many, many inputs here. And the same thing, instead of having one output, we have multiple outputs. Of course, these could be a lot of base stations, a lot of uh, 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 um, small cells, a lot of femtocells transmitting to many users here, okay? Of course, these boxes can be all related or not together, and all the users here can be or not related between them. If they are related here between them, then it's a multiple antenna system, meaning you have many antennas on a device transmitting to many antennas on another device. But it could be also many uh, boxes at home that you have which are connected to an ADSL line and you can have also many users here which are connected to what we call device-to-device -device communications. Okay? And basically you can have also some feedback from one of the outputs here to one of the inputs here or from one of the outputs here to some of the inputs here. So typically in a classical cellular system you have to know that this is a base station this is a user in a cell, this is a base station, this is a user in a cell, and this user feeds back automatically here. But of course, you get also signal here. So you have many ways of doing it. One of the big problems we have to, control, to understand how much MIMO can bring us in 5G is to understand how much information I can transmit from here to here with the constraints that have been put in 5G. What are the constraints that have been put in 5G is that you have mobility, so basically, you need to transport a certain amount of information from here to here within a fraction of time. And that's basically because the box here moves across time. So for people who are familiar with that, this is a channel. And with finite energy. What does it mean, finite energy? It means the total energy you can use to transport this information from here to here is limited. And basically, when you have that constraint, you have to know that things change radically. i give you an example that we do in communication. In telecom, what we do to transmit information from here to here, there's one fraction of your time before your transmission that you dedicate to training. It means that you send a certain amount of energy to train and estimate the box here. And once you estimated the box, the rest of your data that you have here, you recover it because you have a good estimation. Now, if you have a lot of entries here, be careful, and you have a limited number of energy, then the strategy is bad 
and there's also an optimal number of antennas that you should use. Why? If you have too many inputs, then basically you are sending peanuts energy per input. So once I send my training sequences, I have a very bad estimate of my channel. So when I transmit my data, I make a lot of errors. So typically the story tells you that there's a trade-off between exploration and exploitation, something people know in classical learning problems, that basically the optimal number of antennas that you should use, the optimal bandwidth, be careful, this can be also bandwidth for a lot of people, there is also a limited number of bandwidth that you should use because the more bandwidth you have, the more energy you need to transmit to estimate all those degrees of freedom that you have there. Of course, the way I gave you right now to transmit information is not the optimum way. We know that basically if, for example, this box changes every time, then for sure you should never send a training sequence. You should do what we call non-current communication, and basically what it means, it means you have to do a strategy which is called on-off keying. Either you transmit or you don't, and at the receiver there's a detector of energy. So the fact that you split your transmission between a training and communication is not necessarily the best way. And for a given, I would say, mobility pattern, determining the best way is also a problem. Okay, good. Now, I will solve one case, because what I told you is the generic problem in its globality. I'm going to solve one case which is very specific. It's the case where all these are related and all these are related. This is called the MIMO, this classical MIMO system, multiple input, multiple input output, which is also called the multiple antenna system. And basically, when all this is related, all this is related, I'm going to ask myself, if you are in a linear system, so y equal wx plus n, so of course what I showed you before is also related to nonlinear medium like fiber, okay? But let me be very specific and go step by step. Suppose that it's linear, and suppose for some reason that you know this w here. So there is no need to send a training sequence, there is a genie telling you the box here. Okay? Then there's two approaches to know how much information you can transmit from here to here. And these are results developed already around 1995 by a guy called Emre Tilatar. The story tells you, well, if you want to know the information that you can transmit from here to here without error, well, it's the differential entropy of the vector y minus the differential entropy of the vector y knowing x. Okay? Since uh, w is known, well, uh, the only source of uncertainty when you calculate the the differential entropy of the vector y knowing x is the differential entropy of the noise. Is that clear? So if I suppose, because I don't want to go into the details, if I suppose that x is Gaussian and n is Gaussian, in fact, it turns out that this is, if this is the best way you can do for transmitting information, but I don't want to spend time on that. But suppose that x is Gaussian, then basically the differential entropy of the vector y is nothing else than the log determinant of P e R y, and the determinant and the differential entropy of the vector n is log det P pi e R n, which is the covariance. Now this is the covariance of y and the covariance of the noise. The story tells you that the amount of information you can transport in a box, in a medium, is only related to the covariance of the received vector and the covariance of the noise. More specifically, it's related to the eigenvalues, or eigenmodes, of the covariance of Ry and the covariance of Rn. You can see it also from the, from the point of view of Wiener. Wiener would tell you the following very easily. Y is a multidimensional vector that I'm receiving. Is that clear for everybody? My multidimensional vector is spanning a certain sphere. I'm transmitting the vector Wx. Why Wx? Because I know W. So it turns out here that it's Wx, and I have a certain noise. So the number of Wx that I can transmit is the number of little spheres that I can pack in the big sphere. Okay. What is the volume or what is the space the big sphere is occupying? Well, it's the covariance. What is the volume? It's proportional to the determinant of the covariance. So the, vo sorry. So the volume of the big sphere is proportional to the determinant of Ry. What is the volume of the little sphere? It's proportional to the determinant of Rn. How many little sphere I can pack in the big, big sphere is the ratio. What is the rate? It's the log. And of course, both formulas are the same. So the idea now of Wiener, as you can see here, that was the approach of Wiener taken back after by Shannon, tells you that if you minimize here what we call the error, you see, y minus wx is the error. If you minimize at each step the error, you can increase the rate until you have the noise. So minimizing the mean square at each step increases your rate, 
until you get exactly the capacity. And we'll see that there's a link between the capacity and the MMSC. Now let's go specifically to the case where y equals equal wx plus n. Then basically you can write this formula in a very easy manner and the story, the story tells you that if you write it, ry is given by this, rn is given by this, and the rate is nothing else than the log determinant of identity, one divided by sigma square, wwh. wwh here, H here is transpose conjugate, and WWH here is the gram matrix associated to W. The rate at which you can transmit is nothing else than related to the eigenvalues of this box here. Okay? This you have to capture. Okay. Now let's go back to history and try to understand how am I able to understand the rate at which I can transmit in a medium for general boxes. It turns out that uh, for people who are uh, uh, more specialist to physics, there's something called the Schrodinger equations, which is quite known, where you have here an operator, which is the Hamiltonian, where you have phi i, which is called a wave function, ei is the energy level on which uh, this wave function goes, times phi i. So of course, for uh, people who are not in the operator business, this is a matrix, this is, I would say, an eigenvector, this is an eigenvalue, and here you have also an eigenvector. So, one of the big problems that you have in the Schrodinger equation is to solve this equation and find the energy levels on which goes these electrons. Okay? That was a big problem to solve, especially when you have heavy nucleons. Okay? It turns out that the guy called Wigner had the smart idea of trying to solve that equation by asking himself the following. It's quite, very, it's quite difficult to solve that Schrodinger equation for a very specific interaction of all the different uh, components. He said, what if I replace the matrix by a random matrix which has the same properties? What it means is the same properties. You have the spin which is minus one plus one, okay? So it's symmetric because the interaction I have here with another one is the same that I have here with me, okay? So you have zero on the diagonal and you have plus and minus ones which are flipped randomly with the property of one half. And it's a symmetric. And he asked himself, well, what, is the eigen, what are the eigenvalues of this matrix here? Instead of asking himself what are the, the eigenvalues of this matrix, he asked himself, could I find any result on the counting measure of these eigenvalues? It turns out that if you take MATLAB and you plot the eigenvalues of that matrix and you start increasing the size, it's quite uh, incredible. You have something called the semicircular law. It means that the eigenvalues, as the size increases, the counting measure, so we call the empirical eigenvalue distribution of that matrix, tend to converge according to a certain type of convergence, we'll talk about it, to this semicircular law. What's very neat is that the eigenvalues are between minus two and plus two. They are not outside the support. You find them all in the support there. So what it means, it means that there's some kind of uh, averaging effect that Although the entries can be anything, we'll see to which level they can be anything. In fact, you can reduce the assumption on this matrix here, and it took some time, where instead of having minus one plus one, any random matrix with zero mean variance one plus some constraints on the fourth moment, but each year they're going down on the moment's uh, assumption, will have this specific result there. Okay, so what it means for telecommunication, of course. For telecommunication, it means that we are able to compute and know the rate that you can transmit here to here with some very generic boxes. We don't need to specify exactly boxes as long as all the generic transmission environments fulfill that condition, then I can tell you how much rate I can transport in a network, okay? Of course, there is no reason why my box is symmetric, okay? So this result will never apply. Okay, just for, to give you a, a, a thing. What's the ID for people who are interested in the proof? It's quite easy. I mean, I'm giving you the combinatorics approach. The combinatorics approach is quite, is quite at least straightforward, but then you have to be good in calculus. If you calculate one over n of the trace of a matrix, what is this trace? It's the sum of the eigenvalues. So it's nothing else than the integral of lambda, dfn of the lambda, where dfn is the empirical eigenvalue distribution, it's the counting measure, you just count the number here, it's a lambda i, I'm sorry. What is one over n of the trace of h square? It's the sum square of the eigenvalues. What is one over n of the trace of the power of hk? It's the integral of lambda k, dfn of lambda. So if you're smart enough, 
you can first calculate the expectation of all these terms when n goes to infinity and see if you get some kind of generic terms. If you can get some kind of generic terms, then from the moments you'll be able to calculate these distribution up to some condition called the Kalman condition. Then you take off the expectation and then you do also the calculus to see also if you have some stronger result in terms of convergence. Okay? It turns out that the guy who did it was Catalan. Okay? And Catalan, for that specific case, I mean, so Wigner, of course, used the result, but it's known. If you calculate 1 over n of the trace to h to the power of 2k, you can show that you get this value. And if you calculate uh, 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 the, the odd moments, 2k plus 1, they vanish. And it turns out that the only distribution which has those moments is the semicircular law. So you have one way of proving it. Now, of course, if you want to work more on the field, what you have to do, you take any other matrix, which is here, Hermitian or symmetric. Uh, you calculate the moments. And if you're good in those calculus, you try to prove some convergence of the terms and find the distribution of this empirical eigenvalue distribution. Okay? Of course, for that, you need to be very good. Uh, and, and, and very good in calculus of, of moments. You have to know, as I showed you, that in 1958, that's exactly the result that was proven by Wigner. It was not related only to minus 1 plus 1, but uh, if you took any standard Wigner matrix, so you took here a, 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 a matrix with zero mean variance 1, and you had the fourth moment bounded, then you had this result, which was true. Okay? It turns out that since that time, we have here 2 plus epsilon constraint. Okay? Now things have been moving a bit further in our community and showing that you need less constraints to have this convergence. Okay? Another case, and we'll see how things are built. If you take a matrix which is not symmetric this time, you take any matrix here n times n in which you fill the entries with minus 1 plus 1 randomly. If you look at how the empirical eigenvalue distribution is distributed, you'll see that it is uniformly distributed on the unit circle, on the unit disk, sorry. Okay, it fulfills uniformly the unit disk. And in fact, I didn't say it, you have an almost sure convergence of the empirical eigenvalue distribution towards this thing here. Okay? Now, of course, same thing. Many constraints in terms of results showing less and less constraints. You have to know that one of the guys who proved this is a guy called Gierko. So uh, for people who know a bit Gierko, it's quite surprising. This guy is able to prove lots of theorems. He's not so well accepted by the mathematical community because basically his proofs do not follow the classical way that the, the community uses. He's, uh, he's from Ukraine. Uh, and and he, uh, by the way, he still doesn't have a position. He goes from place to place every time on, on, on a short-term position. And because some of his papers, you'll see, were not accepted, he even opened his own, his own journal to publish his papers. So of course, uh, if you have a problem in getting accepted your papers, just create your own journal and then uh, ask some friends to publish over there. I think that, that, that's a way. Now, of course, those were asymptotic results. Uh, as you know, we work in the finite realm. It turns out that uh, there's a lot of interesting results related to random matrices. The first is what we call the distribution insensitivity, meaning that the asymptotic distribution does not depend on the distribution of the independent entries. You can take it more broad, and this is very good for us because in general when we do channel modeling, we need the least assumptions on the, on the environment. The ergodicity, the eigenvalue histogram of one realization converge almost surely to the symptotic eigenvalue distribution. The almost sure convergence is obtained in many cases. I'll show you to which, uh, to which level it's done. The speed of convergence tends to be also very good. We have eight, which is equal to infinity, meaning that with the number, which is, this is called central limit theorems, meaning you can show that the speed of convergence turns out to be uh, not so bad. And if you decide one day not to use the asymptotic approach, but the finite approach, it turns out to be a real mess. I've tried it many times. If you try to analyze the thing in the finite case, if it goes outside the Gaussian case, then it's very hard to calculate any kind of distribution. The things can, can get very messy. Okay. What would you call calculating this? Uh, calculate distribution in which sense? Meaning having an explicit form. You calculate an explicit form of the distribution when it's not Gaussian. So typically, you ask me in the finite case, uh, give me the uh, limit. I mean, the eigenvalue, the empirical eigenvalue distribution, or the, the eigenvalue distribution of this matrix, for a specific case which is not Gaussian. No? Then it tends to be very messy. Whereas in the in in the asymptotic setting, you don't need Gaussianity. You do whatever you want. You get still the. Uh, yes, it would be some 
kind of integrable systems lurking uh, behind if you expect for. Uh, so already when it's Gaussian, you get into, not in this case, to other case with Lagarde polynomials, and it gets very, very messy. And if it's not Gaussian, it's even more. That's what I'm saying. So you, you get some, some very thing. And in fact, you don't necessarily get the distribution. You get the Fourier transform of the distribution in general, which is already a problem because then you have to go back. And it, it's, it's really tedious. OK. Now, let me take, you, let me take this case, which is a very interest of interest for communication. Remember, in the initial problem I showed you, we were interested in a case which was WWH. That was the, the, the case I was interested in. I was not interested in a Hammerschen matrix. I was interested in the case where you have a matrix times another one, okay? Where you have K here and N, meaning that you have, can, can have more inputs than outputs, okay? This, in the case where it's Gaussian, okay? A zero mean variance one is called Wishart matrix. In the classical sense, it's nothing else than the gram matrix associated to H that I'm writing here. You have to know that in the case uh, where uh, K and N are big enough, okay, but the ratio tends to a constant alpha, so K is big, N is big, but K over N tends for a constant, we have an explicit form, and this is called the Marshenko pasture law. We have an explicit form of the distribution, and it's something that is explicit and is given by this formula. What's interesting is not the formula. There are two things about the formula which are interested. The first thing is that the formula depends at the end only on alpha, meaning the ratio between k and n. That's the first thing. The second thing which is interesting is that this distribution has a compact support, and the compact support on the left is lower bounded by 1 minus root square of alpha square, and upper bounded by 1 plus root square of alpha square. F to give you an example, it's something like this that you get. Same thing, when the dimension of your matrix increases, but the ratio tends to be a constant, the empirical eigenvalue distribution converges, and you can show that it's an almost sure converges, towards the marshenko pasteur law here. Okay? So very neat, and you have an explicit form of that. Of course, be careful, some people were talking about numerics. Uh, when you multiply this matrix, which is fully IID, by this matrix, which is fully IID, it doesn't give you the identity matrix, okay? Although, if you decided to implement it on things, you have to be careful. So many times when I ran my program, uh, you have to know I made a lot of mistakes, because if you store first what you had, and then compile the eigenvalues, you'll get, you'll get one. Why? Because you multiply something big by something very big, you get here a zero. <laughs> you multiply something big by something big, you, uh, sorry, something big by something big, you get a one. Is that okay for everybody? Because this is uh, an n times k matrix with the ID elements, zero mean and variance one over n. Take minus one plus one, flip them, it's not a problem, okay? So you take minus one plus ones here, you get a one, you get a zero, you get a zero, you get a zero, you get a zero asymptotically, and the same thing, and you get something which is identity. But you have to know that the, the terms which are outside the diagonal are small, but the sum, you have n square terms, which go towards zero at the speed of one over n square, the, the sum does, is not going to zero, okay? But so numerically, if you decide to implement a system which is big enough, you have to be careful, because then you'll get some wrong result related to the mathematics. And this gave me a headache a couple of years ago, because I thought my formulas were wrong, but it was the, 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 the processor when I was running the thing which was wrong. <laughs> so you have to be careful about these rounding effects. Uh, uh, dep it depends how you write your code. <laughs> if you store first the things, then you have this rounding effect, and it puts to zero, and then you do. But this is a, a trick you have to be fam familiar with. And, and uh, a particular case of Marchenko Pasteur is, uh, is uh, the, the semi-circle, right? When you take uh, in your notation, it's alpha equal one or something. Yes, alpha equals one in your notation. Uh, so alpha equal one? No, because uh, no. If alpha equal one, because if alpha equal one means that this matrix is square, and you get h a transmission. But it's not gonna. It's still gonna give you a, a new Martian co What does it give? What, what is it? Because then it simplifies, right? In the uh, can you put it put again the Martian co um, Yes, first term is zero. Yes. And second term is code or gives absolute value x minus a. It's gonna give something which is bounded between zero and four. That's oh. that's the bound, and it's gonna give you four. Okay, so let, let us continue now. Of course, um, 
to solve the more complicated cases, people do not use the moment method that I showed you before. I'm doing this. They use something called uh, the cauchy stilgers transform. So the cauchy stilgers transform, well, it depends first if you are on the European side or the uh, American side. In the, in the American side, they always call it the stilgers transform. And in Europe, they call it the cauchy transform. Here, we'll call it the cauchy stilgers. <laughs> there is always a fight between, but let's call it the cauchy stilgers transform here. So what is the cauchy stilgers transform? Mathematically, it tells you that if you have here a measure of mu, the cauchy stilgers transform is nothing else than an integral of 1 over t minus z mu dt here. That's the definition. And of course, if you do the transform, there should be an inverse. And by taking here the imaginary part of this cauchy stilgers transform, you can get back to the measure. OK? So this is very abstract, what I'm saying. But it turns out that the cauchy stilgers transform, as you can see here, because of the t minus z, is nothing else than a moment generating function. OK, up to. If you see it here, if I write it here, you can have this term here where these are the moments. So what the story tells you is instead of calculating the moments each time, it's much better to calculate the cauchy stilgers transform on one shot, and then you get the distribution. You're not going to calculate all the moments. Okay? That's the first thing you have to, to capture. Now, second thing which is very important to telecommunication we'll see is that the cauchy stilgers transform has a given um, meaning, and we'll see what is the, the meaning. Mathematically, not telecommunication-wise, mathematically, the meaning is what we call the trace of the resolvent. So what is a resolvent? You take a matrix, you calculate W minus the perturbation. I'm saying in telecommunication this is very important because the people who are working in telecommunication, they'll see that this is related to the MMSC receiver, okay, very rapidly. But without going into what we call the MMSC receiver, talk about just the resol resolvent, and you have here a matrix minus a, a perturbation to which you're doing it. Now, if you have what we call the empirical eigenvalue distribution here, then if you take the integral of dfn of x, x minus z, where this is the counting measure, you write it, you get 1 over n of the trace of the resolvent. What it means, it means that the cauchy stilgers transform is nothing else than 1 over n of the trace of the resolvent. So to calculate rapidly the distribution or the eigenvalue distribution of a matrix, you only need to calculate 1 over n of the trace of this matrix and see how this thing behaves. OK? And that's how they do it. Now, this is the, fir the first trick you have to do. And of course, once you have this, while well, you invert it, because you remember, huh? this has an inverse, and you can calculate there. We'll see, that, of course, that in communication, we never need to invert it. Why? Because this has a very specific meaning, and this is what we call the SINR at the output of an MMSC receiver when z here is minus sigma square, which is the noise variance. OK? Good. Now, of course, without getting into more results, let me go now after the 50s to something that happened in the 80s, OK, in the field of random matrices, and for which we started to have more complicated results. Why we had more complicated results? Because, of course, when you look at what I gave you at the beginning, it was always zero mean, variance one, stuff like this. And it turns out that we had some cases where the mean is not zero, and it got more complicated. OK? And now, the question that one can ask, and this is a guy who's called Voiculescu, who was a professor in Berkeley in the 80s, who uh, uh, opened the field. The question that you can ask yourself is if you have a matrix C, which is equal to A plus B. So typically, remember you had here a W, which is your random matrix zero mean, to which you add a deterministic component, because you need something which is non-zero mean. Okay? And you ask yourself, if I know the eigenvalues of A, and I know the eigenvalues of B, can I know the eigenvalues of C? It turns out, of course, that it's not possible. Why? Because you need also to know the eigenstructure. Okay? Because depending on where your matrices point their energy, well, if they point on the same direction, then, of course, you have a constructive effect. If they point in another direction, something else happens. Okay? Now, it turns out that there are some cases that Voiculescu showed where if you calculate the moments of C, which are related to the eigenvalues, 1 over n of the trace of CK. Where by calculating 1 over n of the trace of CK, meaning those moments, you remember, these are the eigenvalues of C, you have something which depends only on the moments of A and the moments of B, but not the joint distribution, only on the marginals. 
When you get this effect here, meaning that when it happens, well, basically, what you have is something called freeness, meaning the two matrices A and B have deconnected eigenvector structure. You have freed the eigenvector structure. The eigenvector, they don't, their eigenstructure do not depend on each other. Of course, you can have this effect for the sum, but you can also have this effect for the product, A times B. Okay? Now, of course, I don't want to get into, detail, into the details of this uh, 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 theory. Uh, it has nothing to do with independence. Be careful. You can always have two, two matrices which are independent, that you generate independently, but which point on certain directions because that's the distribution. Freeness is exactly about the, the fact that you have an effect where all the moments uh, of the matrix C here, or more complicated, depends only on the marginals. So how can you have some matrices which are free? It's very easy. Well, deconnect the eigenstructure. So if you take a matrix which is AN, deterministic, or anything else, and you take a matrix B, if they're not free, well, just multiply the matrix here and here by unitary invariant matrix. If you do that, then these two matrices are free. Because then, due to the fact that this matrix is unitary invariant, the eigenstructure does not depend. And I'm able here, for example, to calculate the eigenvalue distribution of A plus theta BN theta H, if you want, even if I was not able to calculate AN plus BN. Okay? Now, of course, there's a lot of application of this theory because once you do that, you can understand that you can calculate, and we'll see some examples, uh, the concatenated product of matrices, many sums of matrices. So many matrices which have more and more structure which are related to our problems of communication. And we'll see some of the cases which are of interest for us. Okay. Let me now go to communication because all this theory that I've been showing, and of course there's a lot much more results, has some application. So this is typically for people who are not in the communication realm, a MIMO system, meaning that you have an, uh, a transmitter with many antennas, sorry if it's on the left, I'm sorry, <laughs> going to transmitting towards here with a receiver with many antennas. The input-output relation is exactly what I showed you before. You have a vector y, which is the convolution of what you transmitted here by something called the channel plus noise, okay? I'll jump on this. Usually you have to know that the basic models that people use in communication assume that the matrix that you have here is ID zero mean. We'll see that there are much more cases, but many applications in communication that was the starting point of the MIMO, I would say hype, considered that the entries of your matrix that I'm considering is IID Gaussian zero mean variance one. The main reason, of course, is that, uh, and Cédric told us about this this morning, is if you apply the maximum entropy theorem, meaning that you assume that you know nothing about where the transmission took place. And that's basically what happens when you don't do measurements. You have no clue where the transmission took place. But you know that your channel has finite energy because, of course, the energy does not grow with your weird thing. Then it's very simple to apply the maximum entropy principle to showcase that the distribution that you should get is a Gaussian distribution with IID entries, okay? And that's one of the reasons this IID model became such a big hype. It's because it's the one which makes the least assumption on your environment. Of course, the more you have assumptions on your environment, meaning that you know that there's a wall, that there's chairs, that there's people, you can, of course, and this is a, a big, I would say, uh, uh, framework in maximum entropy methods, and there's a lot of maximum entropy engineering methods where they start adding more and more constraints on your problems to find what is the distribution which is mapped to the constraints of, of your thing. But let's forget about this. The most important for me is that now, I suppose that W here is ID zero mean Gaussian, okay? And you remember, this, this was the rate, okay? Now, if you go back, this is the rate, and the rate is nothing else than one over N, the sum of K to N log of one plus lambda K, the eigenvalues divided by sigma squared. Clear? By the way, this is why people believe a lot in MIMO. It's because thanks to the fact that you sum up the rates, you're able to increase the classical Shannon rate. For people who are not familiar with the, with the, with the MIMO hype, uh, this is why people are, get so excited in 5G, but also in the latest uh, 4G releases, is that the more you add antennas, this is the antennas, the more you add what we call multiplexing space multiplexing gains every time, 
Okay? But of course, as you can see here, everything depends on the lambda. If the lambda is equal to zero, then basically you don't get any more new mode. Okay? Now, you remember when, when n goes to infinity and k over n goes to a constant, well, this thing is nothing else than integral log of 1 plus t over sigma square, delimiting uh, eigenvalue distribution, and this delist limit is nothing else than the limit of the empirical eigenvalue distribution. Now, what's exciting about this formula is that if you derive the capacity with respect to 1 over sigma square, it ends up, it ends up that the derivative of the rate is highly related to a mathematical comp concept called the cauchy steeldrift transform. What I'm saying here is that the derivative of the rate in a MIMO system in communication is a mathematical concept called the cauchy steeldrift transform. So deriving the cauchy steeldrift transform of many, many MIMO systems is of big interest because of this huge link between the two. Second point now. Uh, before, slightly before, maybe there was a statement I don't understand. Uh, a result of finite energy knowledge, IAD Gaussian model. What do you mean? Yeah, meaning that you assume this. You see, my assumptions, what I did is two things. Oh. I assume that there's nothing, and the only thing I, I know is that the expectation of the energy is this. Uh -huh. So what I'm saying is that if you want to if you wanna, wanna, wanna derive some kind of rate in a given environment for which you know nothing, except the fact that you know that there's finite energy, then the model which uh, makes the least assumption from a maximum entropy principle is the IID Gaussian model. And this is why one of the reasons uh, there is a centrality of this uh, IID Gaussian model in all the papers that you see in our community. Uh, here, uh, energy being square, why and what, uh, what does this square correspond to physically? So you mean here? Yes. OK. So this, so yeah, bum, 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 bum. So the HIJs are these links. You see, this is H11, H12, HN. So the link here, this is the, 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 the link that you have related to environment. In general, this is, it depends. I mean, this is, for the moment, this is nothing. It's just a link, OK? Now, the, the, the value that you measure here in general, when depending on the distance, this is the path loss. The energy, the value of that which is related to the path loss is the energy. So the square of this is the path loss that you get. I don't know if I'm clear, yeah? OK. If not, then you just ask me uh, another question. But OK. So what I did here for, you, for your information, uh, I took this cauchy steeldrift transform of the Martian copacitor law, calculated this. And if you do that, you can get an explicit formula of the rate. You see? This is the rate that you get. You can get an explicit formula of the rate in a MIMO system. And the rate is given by the ratio k over n, number of transmitting to receiving antennas. And it depends only on the SNR, because this gamma is, is related to here. It's not important to know what the expression is, but just to tell you that you're able to compute the rate of a MIMO system in a very efficient manner. Okay. Now, of course, this is just to give you an example. The reality, we've been doing measurements, is much more complicated. In general, Taking a fact that you have some buildings, so you have some what we call scatchers, it turns out that you have models for which from the transmitter to the receiver, you have some reflections before the wave arrives here because it bounces on something here and then it will bump and then it will bump before it arrives. In general, the models that people use are what we call the Kronecker model or much more complicated, which just tells you that my matrix is not IID zero mean, but there is a matrix before and a matrix after. It's the product of three matrices. Okay? Why? Because you have a scattering effect when the transmitter bounces on the scatters. Then it goes around many things. And at the receiver, the receiver sees the scatters. So your model has a product of three matrices. What's interesting here also, by using the same techniques that I did, so it's not, it's not anymore the Martian copacitor law, you can derive explicitly the rate. And you can have some very neat information, not only on the rate, but something called the outage capacity. It means that you can derive a central limit theorem telling you that the rate, asymptotically, when the number of antennas increases, goes toward a certain value and a certain fluctuation. This is called the outage. Okay? And to give you just an example, so here, I mean, uh, we can jump, but you can derive it explicitly. What's interesting is that we did, a couple of years ago, some measurements at 2.1 gigahertz with an antenna of bandwidth 100 megahertz 
uh, with an antenna with eight elements at the, the, the transmitter and 32 elements at the receiver. But be careful in what I'm going to show you, we used only eight elements here. It's an eight by eight MIMO systems. And what, it, what the theory tells you, so this is for people who are not familiar, this is a batch array antenna. So you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And here you have one, two, three, four, five. So this is your antenna, six. So here, eight times four. Okay, so we used only the four here and the four here. And what's interesting, so here typically what you do, this is the receiving antennas and this is the transmitting antenna that you move and you do measurement in different environments and you capture exactly the different channels. What's interesting, of course, is that it turns out that by mapping up the number of scatterers and looking at them, you have a closed mapping. So here, this is different scenarios, indoor, urban, area, atrium, things like that. If you calculate the cumulative distribution and you look at your formula and tweak them, you have a matching of both. And it matches exactly what you have there, okay? Other point, time is running, other point. Let's go back now to uh, uh, the receiver, okay? Typically for people who are not familiar to, 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 uh, to signal processing, let me take a generic model where you have a vector y which is equal to W S plus N. So W is my matrix, which is N times K. <coughs> my emitted vector is K times one. And this is an additive white Gaussian noise. In general, when you transmit, your goal is to retrieve the emitted signal here. Okay, so this is a signal which has been transmitted and your goal is to recover it. Okay, when you recover, you have this vector which has a lot of components. The components, I split them into S1 and the rest of the vector X. And here I have U and big U, okay? Now to recover it, it's not so simple because you have y equal ws plus n. I take the first column s1 plus ux plus n, okay? My goal is to retrieve s1, which is the first, what the first antenna is transmitting, okay? So what I do here is I write it as, of course, for people who are interested, you could do y minus ws and test all the cases. This is called the maximum likelihood receiver. In general, it's very complex because it depends on the constellation of s here. The more the size is big, and the more the number of antennas is big, the more complicated it gets. Okay, so if you have a BPSK and you have N antenna, it's two to the power of N cases that you have to check. Okay, so here, what you do in general is you try to do a receiver which tends to recover. So one classical receiver, what it does, it tells you, okay, if you're interested in S1, you consider all the rest here as interference. This is called interference plus noise. This is the noise, and the rest of the other streams which are arriving towards you are called interference, which you can write as us1 plus n prime. Now, the noise that you have here, the new noise, because it's interference, is not white. Why it's not white? If you calculate the expectation of n prime, n prime h, well, it has a certain structure, okay, because there's interference due to the streams. So one first thing that any good signal processing expert engineer does is to whiten the noise. Every time they like to whiten the noise. So the first thing that you take, you look at the covariance, you take the root square of the covariance, and the, when you take the root square of the covariance, you multiply it here, you see, and you multiply it here. That gives you this new signature plus B. And one of the good things about B is that it's white. Okay, I'll explain why it's white. This goes back to Wiener, because the, the idea of Wiener was to say that in a white environment, the match filter is optimal. And everybody likes to go back to the match filter as the processor when the noise is white. So the first thing you do is you whiten the, the, the noise here, okay? Now, if I go back to my model, you see, this is what you get, S1 plus B. Now, it turns out that this theory goes back to uh, Wiener. The SINR is maximized when you have white noise by the match filter. So if I call this J, I just do the match filter and I get this. So at the end, if I look at the receiver, and everybody, at least in my lab, knows this, if I look at all the if, different steps I did, the linear receiver which maximizes the SINR is nothing else than what we call the MMSC receiver, minimum mean square receiver. This is what I put here. Of course, for people who are familiar with that, uh, you have the unbiased and biased MMSC receiver. They are the same up to scalar constra constraint, okay? and the bias is not a very big issue, but you have to be careful that one is with W and one when you, is when you extract the colon. So this has, of course, properties of implementation depending if you take off the colon or you keep always the same inverse. So of course, people tend to implement this 
because you don't need to invert it every time. This is not my goal here. My goal was now to calculate the SINR. So if I look at the SINR, at the end, the SINR is my signal of interest, the J that I put here divided by the J. If I look at the SINR at the end, it's a quadratic form. Everybody sees the quadratic form here? UH multiplied by UUH, the other column of my matrices, sigma square identity plus and U here. It's a quadratic form. Good. Now, the SINR is a quadratic form. It turns out that you can show, it's not very difficult, that if this vector, meaning here, this vector is independent from the other signatures, okay? Then you can show, then this quadratic form, so if u is independent of a, then this quadratic form is close to 1 over n of the trace of a. Okay? This is called the trace lemma. Trace lemma. So what it means, it means that my SINR is nothing else than 1 over n of a trace of something here. And for people who followed me previously, this is called a resolvent. 1 over n of the trace of a resolvent. So what it means, it means that the SINR in communication, the SINR in communication is exactly a cauchy stilgers transform. Very spectacular. Meaning that the cauchy stilgers transform has a very specific meaning in telecommunication. It is the SINR at the output of an MMSC receiver of a MIMO system, of a multiple antenna system. So that's why a lot of people have been spending time using random matrices to calculate the cauchy stilgers transform of many, many models because that gives you exactly the performance of the MMSC receiver. Now, if I summarize, the SINR at the output of the MMSC receiver is the cauchy stilgers transform at the point minus sigma square. The derivative of the capacity is something related to the cauchy stilgers transform. So the derivative of the capacity is very linked to the SINR at the output of the MMSC receiver. Okay? You have to know that these links have been brought up recently in 2005 in many papers in our community showing that there's a big link between Shannon and Wiener. So I showed you the link between Wigner and Shannon, but there's also a big link between Wiener and Shannon because, of course, every time you're able to calculate the SINR, you're able to calculate the capacity, okay? Because of the strong link between the two. And effectively, you have to know that because of that, there has been many generalization of what I've been doing in even rethinking the way the, what we call the water filling formula is done. As you know, the water filling formula that you classically do in communication has one big problem, it assumes that you have Gaussian signaling. Here for the SINR, it didn't assume any Gaussian signaling. And now, because of the link, you're able to do much more than capacity. You can show that the derivative of the mutual information is related to some MMSC also. And people have been deriving some new formulas of the, wa the, 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 the water filling formula called the mercury water filling formula, which takes into account that you have constellations which are not Gaussian. Now, why is there a big link between the two? I don't know. These are the mathematics. But if you read the paper of Shannon, in any case, it turns out that Wiener had a big, big impact on the work of Shannon, and he, he's one of the guys even who's been recorrecting the paper of Shannon in many respects and telling him, uh, look at this point and what you're going to do. Okay, I think I took much more time than, than, than expected. I'll jump on this because there's, by the way, for people who are interested, uh, there's a lot of interesting things also that you can do. You can also do some implementation of random matrices uh, what we call a multi-stage uh, uh, pre-coder detector. I'll jump on this. Uh, I'll finish with that. Um, there is a movie that you should see. It's a very bad movie, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> called The Proof. So in fact, I was going to Singapore to give a talk on random matrices, and I was looking at the movie. And in fact, what you have to know is that Anthony Hopkins is a great mathematician. He's got a, a, a nice daughter, which is Gwyneth Paltrow, and this is uh, uh, the lover. Let's say that there's always a lover in a movie. In any case, so uh, Anthony Hopkins dies in the movie, and he's a great mathematician, mathematician at university. And then uh, his daughter, which is there, just uh, showcase. I mean, so there's a. Uh, um, I mean, she showcases a proof telling that she's the one who made it. Okay. Of course, nobody believes because they think that it's the father who, before dying, who made the proof, and then she just took the papers and showed them there. And so there's a whole battle where the guy here starts trusting her, and then he doesn't trust her, and then they start fighting, and then, and then, But in case, at the end of the movie, they, they, they brought a lot of mathematicians around the table uh, to find if it's true or not. And the solution turns out to be 
random matrices and free property theory. Because at the end, they showcase that many of the results that were done to do the proof were uh, results which were done after the death of, of Anthony Hopkins and were late 83, 84, which are related to Voiculescu. So I strongly encourage you to see it. It's a very bad movie, but it turns out that it's the only movie which has a citation on random matrices. And you know, if, uh, if one of your discipline goes to Hollywood, then it means it's good. <laughs> People are going to give you some funding for that. <laughs> OK, uh, you have to know that what I showed you here, of course, I did it because we're in the mathematical and algorithmic sciences lab related to communication. But there are other applications of random matrices outside the field of communication. One of the big applications, it turns out that he made a lot of money, Potters and Bouchot, uh, uh, in any case, using random matrices for finance. So they were bought by UBS uh, using exactly some of the tools related to random matrices. But you have also other disciplines which use that. I think I'll finish here. Uh, took too much time, yeah. Any questions? Comments? Could we uh, go back to this? Okay, so apparently it is well known, but not, not by me, this uh, remark by Wiener about why noise so that the match uh, uh, estimate uh, becomes best. What is it exactly, the statement? So, you mean the signal to interference plus noise ratio? Is that it? Uh, no, in this case, well, it was some white. So you said, why do we take the D here, white, white? OK. Uh, yes. And so apparently, we keep the property of the, of the okay. white noise. So two things. Um, you have to know, OK, boom. Good. If you have a system which is equal Y WS plus N, OK? And your goal is to maximize what we call the SINR. So the linear receiver, which maximizes the signal to interference plus noise ratio, is the MMSC receiver. Okay? Linear, be careful. Non-linear, then you go another thing. So the community... Among linear signals. Among linear receivers, among linear, linear structures, structures, meaning I just do linear operation of this thing. Yes. I don't do non-linear operation of this. Yes. Yeah. So the community, in general, what they do, of course, what I showed you here is the composition of each step. They just apply this thing here, which is the thing. But the idea behind is, of course, that when you write it this way, you first whiten the noise. OK? Th that's exactly what the MMSC receiver is going to do. It's going to whiten the noise. You, you mean you replace the noise by white noise with same, or what? No, you whiten it, meaning that you make an operation. You see? So here, the noise has a certain structure. Yes. The first thing you do is that you apply on your vector y some kind of operation which will whiten the noise, which is the root square of your covariance. See, if I multiply this, if I multiply, this is, this is the root square of this. Okay. Okay, not exactly the root square, but I'm taking lambda minus 1 half, QHY. Ah, yes. If I multiply, the new noise I have here is white. Yes, okay. You see? Yes. And then, once you whiten, so now I have a system which is totally different, which is Y tilde equal JS1 plus B. Then this is a, 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 a result, but it's very easy to, to showcase. It's a Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Huh? But it's a result known from the radar community. If you have this equal JS1 plus B, the linear processor which maximizes the signal to noise ratio, because here it's noise, it's the matched filter, filter adapté. Okay, if you decompose it this way. But if you don't want, it's also easy to show that the, the receiver which maximizes the signal to interference plus noise ratio is the MMSC receiver, minimum mean square error. Yeah. Other questions? Yes, also uh, other questions. So, okay, uh, uh, there was two quite uh, uh, rather distinct uh, uh, movements in your in your talk. First, with the uh, like future and what will what will occur, five G, etc. Yes, and then it was. Uh, Good uh, uh, optimization and then the Gaussian matrices and so on. Yes. Uh, where is the link between both? Of course, there is in this multi yes. multi channel operator and so on. But where are the, the stakes, the difficulties, what people do have to solve to go into 5G and so on? Okay, good question. So, first thing, um, there's a lot of things in 5G. <laughs> Okay, so one of course of the things I inserted here is a, on a technology called the MIMO technology. Okay, which basically, let me take the first figure here, which is around this 5G stuff. Oh, 
Okay. I think you back home today. Yes, I also think so. I think I'm going to have a hell of a time going back forward. Good. Yeah. So, of course, there's a lot of things in 5G, okay? One of the things, of course, that I've been looking at is what we call the MIMO technology, meaning having here what we call base stations with multiple antennas here. At the moment, in the 5G realm, people are thinking of what we call massive MIMO technology, meaning antennas, which are of the order of 128 to 400 antennas, meaning having base stations with many antennas, okay? Now... Of course, there's many other technologies, but the, if I go on this very specific I've been showing, that's one option, okay? Now, when you a start adding a lot of antennas here, there's many problems. First of all, when you start adding many antennas, you don't have antennas for which you can start having more and more space. The antennas become closer, okay? And depending on the frequency, you have more correlation. So, of course, the assumption I made on the IID assumption does not hold, meaning the links that you have between the different are not IID anymore. That's the first thing you have, okay? The distribution also is not Gaussian. It's something else. We don't know because depending on the frequency on which you go, if you go on millimeter wave or you go down, we have new properties on how the channel is distributed and it will change also the results, okay? So the fact that you have in your matrix that I'm showing here, the randomness becomes, first of all, a new kind of randomness, not IID. You also have line of sight effects meaning line of sight effect. Line of sight meaning that you see your destination, so it's not zero mean. You know, you cannot have a, z a link which is zero mean. On average, it's zero because the guy, you're always seeing him. So you have a, a, a deterministic component, which is the non-zero mean. So basically, you start working on matrices with new properties for the MIMO case. That's the first thing. And then you have to know that what I did until now is the case where, for some reason, you know everything, meaning the W, remember, you know it. Basically, you need to do some protocols of estimation. And when you do this protocol of estimation, the distribution also of your matrix changes. Because the way you estimate makes that the links between them are not ID anymore. Okay, because I suppose that for some reason, you remember when I derived the rate, I suppose that everything is known. So you need some sophisticated channel estimation techniques, which takes into account and rederive some of the results there. Okay, but that's also only for the case that I did here. And then, what I did also, in a very specific, because it's long, I did what we call the point-to-point -point MIMO, meaning that there is a base station with many antennas transmitting to a receiver with many antennas. In communication, you never transmit from one guy to the other guy only. There's one guy to many guys. Okay? And this is what we call the multi-user MIMO, for which the formula is a bit different from that. We have a region of capacity for which you have to derive some things. Okay? And there also you have some problems. Whenever you have many guys here transmitting, then things change also. Okay? Uh, and then also, of course, in the receiver structure I did, the MMSC is not the only one. Huh? You have to know because people have been working on nonlinear techniques, successive inference cancellation. There's many other more sophisticated techniques to do that. Yeah. Uh, but that's also only for the MIMO. Why am I thought about MIMO? Because, of course, that's one of the things which will be maybe solving one of the points here. Not all these things. Oh, there's many other issues. But uh, Other question? Yes. Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, in, uh, information theory, of course, we talk a lot about, in the books, talk a lot about the problem uh, with the transmitter, etc. But they also talk a lot about the coding problem. Yes. How should you code? Uh, and it was for decades a uh, big deal how to make codes which are near the Shannon uh, optimal uh, capacity and things in Vegas. How is it? Uh, how these do these issues affect things and how, what kind of codes are, are, are used? In Vegas? Okay, so that, that's a very good question. Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, I, didn't, I didn't talk about the coding part, I just talked about what we call in our discipline performance. What is the performance you get? Now what you're talking about is the constructive way of achieving that performance. Now, in the point-to-point -point setting, single antenna. As you know, since I think uh, uh, you've been looking at, at things around coding, uh, France was one of the, made the headlines with the invention of the turbo codes, which were supposed to achieve the capacity, and they're not so far from the capacity. You have to know that due to the fact that uh, a lot of patents were put on them, uh, there was a revival of other types of codes called the LDPC codes. 
And now there's a flavor of codes because, of course, once uh, you make people pay royalties, you're trying to look at other options. In LDPC, there was a revival because they're free. In fact, they're free because somebody rediscovered it and they were in a, in a master thesis uh, uh, a long time before. But in any case, so for the point-to-point -point coding, we nearly achieve what we should do. The only problem that we have is that when you do coding, we basically know how to code when you have infinite block length because you know there's this averaging effect in, in the regard to city point. Whenever you have short blocks, and this is one of the problems you have with these things and these things, meaning for the Internet of Things, Internet des Objets, uh, which are emitting, you cannot have messages which are too long. You need to have short messages. So there, we don't know what's the solution of the best codes that you can transmit when you have a very short packet, very bursty. Okay? And then there's the MIMO setting, for which, since 2000, a lot of work have been done on how to generalize the point-to-point -point coding to the dimension where you have space. So people have been working on space-time codes, new type of codes, and this field is rather still open. There's still like a lot of innovation that can be done because of the complexity issues and the performance, and there's a lot of discussions on many types of codes that you can do. Yeah. That's for the coding part. But coding, for example, is one of the problems we have for the short block, for very short block. Uh, we have, but there's also, of course, other 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 uh, problems in coding that I did not specify. I mean, there's still other problem of telecommunication. Okay. okay. No question. Okay, so I think we'll go to the next speaker.